All right, so thank you everyone for being here this morning. Volume okay? We're all good? So um, what a huge topic it is to cover today, and one of really my favorite to go over. What, what I've been asked to talk about is really how mindfulness can support ADHD care. Uh, and it turns out that mindfulness can support uh, many different aspects of it, and we'll be going into a little bit of what ADHD is so we can understand that, and then mindfulness too. I'm curious in getting started, although for a bunch of mental health practitioners, um, I imagine this is, uh, well, we'll see, I, I have a guess, but so how many people here are f fairly familiar with mindfulness or have some familiarity with the practice of mindfulness, which is great. I always say doctors are slow adapters. In medicine, that's not always true so directly, but it feels like anyone who's trained in the last 10 or 15 years in mental health has some familiarity with mindfulness. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a lot of practical sort of ADHD-related stuff, but if we're gonna talk about mindfulness, it's not about the discussion as much as the practice of it. So in getting started even, I just want to start with a very brief mindfulness practice, um, and then we'll move into the rest of the talk. I was getting to those, actually. I was going to actually mention those after this, but I will say there's a long-standing uh, mindfulness practice sometimes done where um, if you hear the phone ring, you know, take that as an opportunity to sort of just take a breath, notice where your attention was, and set your intention again for whatever comes next. So throughout this talk, I will give you the opportunity for every time the bells swing, ring, take a moment to notice where your thoughts have been and then just settle yourself and come back again. You know, and use those high school bells as an opportunity to practice mindfulness. For this practice, what I'd like you to do is just put down whatever's in your hands for a minute. And it doesn't matter if you've practiced before, it doesn't matter if you've practiced many times over, this is just a brief practice. It's actually one that's very practical to use during the day. What I'd like you to do is just shut your eyes for a moment and lower your gaze if you're not comfortable shutting your eyes, just so that nothing is overly engaging. And you'll probably notice right away that there is a physical sensation to breathing, so there's nothing special you have to do. So what I'd like you to do now is just pay attention to the next 15 breaths. And probably you'll get distracted somewhere in there. That's fine. Just come back and start counting wherever you last remember. When you reach 15, just open your eyes so that I can tell that people are finishing. So wherever you are, if you can just bring your attention back now, thanks for participating in that. And that simple practice is something that I think is just, you know, when I talk about you know, integrating mindfulness into everyday life, integrating you know, mindfulness into a busy day, those little simple practices like that are really nice ways to just kind of hit the reset button during the day, you know, to just settle again. So that's sometimes called the 15 breaths practice. And, um, we're going to touch on a few different things like that, but what I'm going to start with today, though, is really just a broader explanation of ADHD. Hopefully, a lot of you are familiar with at least parts of this, but if we're going to understand how mindfulness can really support ADHD care, I think we sometimes have to reframe ADHD itself, which is not what people think it is. It's not really an attention problem specifically. Then I want to talk very briefly about my, you know, how I see mindfulness and sort of laying out a little bit of the science of it, because I think that's practical uh, for reasons I'll, I'll describe in a few minutes. And then really the emphasis of the talk, most of the talk is this last section on just how then do we use mindfulness to support ADHD care overall. So there's a textbook definition of mindfulness. And this textbook definition is how we're supposed to go about diagnosing it, looking for a pattern of symptoms, looking for symptoms across different settings. You know, and it can be very academic and dry, but I think there's two bullet points in what I really find a very minimalistic definition of ADHD. It doesn't really capture ADHD to me at all. But there's two bullet points that I think are important. And certainly as clinicians, 
I think one of the most important things to be aware of in practicing with ADHD is that a lot of people have a lot of misperceptions of ADHD. So becoming just skilled and really describing for people what ADHD is goes a long way to helping out children and adults who have it. Kind of the two key points, I think, from this overly simple version of ADHD, the DSM-5 version, are this. You know, forget all the checklist of symptoms. It's not exactly a checklist of symptoms we're looking for. What we're really trying to do is just establish that this is a trait. I think that's really what we're trying to do. It's like we're trying to so show through gathering enough information from different sources that there's an established pattern of development if you're working with kids that is, um, first of all, significant. And then most importantly, I think the simplest like, way to cut through a lot of the misunderstanding about ADHD is in many ways to tell typical development from not typical development is that that pattern has to be severe enough that you're impairing your own life in some way. And that's really the bottom line, and that's really why ADHD is so important to discuss, and that's really why a lot of you know, the sort of perception, like, like shouldn't boys just be boys, is off base. Because as long as the expectations that we're putting on children is appropriate, they shouldn't be impairing their own progress in life. So the other thing you can see from this definition that doesn't always get talked about is that ADHD often is very relational. It's not just about the individual who has it, and that's a really important point too. ADHD affects children for sure, but then it affects everyone around them too. Certainly affects their parents profoundly, often affects their friends, their teachers. So ADHD in the, in the essence is a bundle of traits that is significantly different from peers to the point that you're impairing your own life in some way. And yet ADHD is much, much more than that. So hopefully anybody working with ADHD is familiar with the fact that really ADHD occurs as or occurs along with deficits in a much bigger skill set called executive function. So how many people here are fairly familiar with executive function? Again, we're talking about clinicians, so I would hope most people have some familiarity with it. But on a practical level, the way to describe for parents in particular, because again, the models are a little different in adults, what's going on with ADHD is that just like you can have language delays or motor delays or delays in any other aspect of development, with ADHD, you can be brilliant and motivated and hardworking and just the sweetest kid ever and you have a delay in the skill set called executive function, which in essence is the brain manager. And ADHD itself, may, I understand, from what I understand, may never get fully renamed executive function deficit disorder, in part simply because it's so baked into federal law, it would be very difficult to change the name of the disorder. But when we look at it as an attention disorder, for example, that's too simple. It really confuses people sometimes, because kids with ADHD often can attend perfectly fine to things they really like. You know, it's not just about a short or long attention span. And many people, what I think is the most inane thing about the name entirely, is that many people don't even have the hyperactivity part. So I haven't said that yet today, but when we're talking about ADHD now, based on the latest diagnostic manual, that includes what we used to call ADD. You know, ADHD has, you can have ADHD with predominantly hyperactive symptoms or predominantly inattentive symptoms or a combined type, but it's all ADHD which is kind of like unnecessarily confusing. So you can have a hyperactivity disorder without the hyperactivity, which often leads people to not even get evaluated. But if we're gonna understand ADHD, we really have to look at it through this lens. And in truth, you know, today is a talk focusing mostly on how to integrate mindfulness into ADHD care, but for many of these concepts I'm bringing up in this introduction, I could spend the whole morning talking about just these concepts. So just briefly, I would say that for anything going on around ADHD, if you can get really familiar with this model, which is uh, adapted from Thomas Brown's work of ADHD, this is where practical problem solving starts. One of the ways I often describe it to parents is like anything that involves management in life could potentially be related to ADHD. Managing projects, managing emotions, managing your attention, managing your behavior, all of that is executive function. So executive function is in what you know. It isn't even if you're trying hard, because executive function includes things like sustained effort. So with ADHD, you can be trying very, very hard and just still not neurologically be able to sustain the effort you need to sustain to finish something. And one of the exercises I sometimes go through with parents or teachers is you can pick any problem in life that goes along with ADHD and start looking at this model, which is, so attention, for anyone who isn't familiar with this model, so attention is managing attention, which means not just 
can you focus, but can you use your attention well? Because a lot of kids with ADHD have just as much tendency to hyper-focus on what they do like as much as not being able to focus when the demands go up, which can often get misperceived as like, well, you do it when you care, and yet that's the fundamental neurology of what's going on. And if you can begin to understand executive function this way, you can also begin to see children's behavior totally differently. So, for example, kids with attention issues can't shift attention very well. You know, if you ask them to do something while they're doing something else, they're never going to do it because they can't get the information in at all. And they're not being defiant or difficult, they just can't shift attention. So you can look at attention, action management is sort of the, the physical part of it, the hyperactivity, the impulsiveness. But really the big picture of ADHD occurs and includes far, far more. So task management is organizing, planning, and time management. Some people think in a, as kids become adults that in adolescence and adults, the core issue with ADHD is something called time blindness. You know, procrastination isn't a choice. It often has to do with not being able to see time at all. You know, leaving a project to the last minute isn't a choice. It's not knowing how to manage a project. Uh, information management is what we usually call working memory. It's keeping track of things in your head. You know, so if someone is sent upstairs to do three things and ends up playing with ADHD, quite often that's not a choice either. That's just because they lost track of the list. We have to teach them a better way to keep track of things. Emotional management. So the reactivity that goes along with ADHD used to be part of the diagnosis. The only reason it's not part of the diagnosis is because it's not specific enough, but it's certainly inherently part of ADHD to be too quick to get angry, too quick to give up, too quick to frustrate. And then I alluded to already sustained effort. So part of working with ADHD in general, before we get to the mindfulness part, is just recognizing that these are actual skills and they are quite impaired in many people with ADHD. It's also important to know that you can't test for these skills specifically. Neuropsychological testing doesn't really capture it fully. So you can have perfectly fine scores and still be struggling in these areas. It's all just about working in real life. And if you think of something as simple as like, well, you know, why the hell don't you just write your stuff down in your day planner so that when you get home, I can help you with your homework. If you look at that through the lens of executive function, you realize that, well, you know, we have to problem solve that a little differently, but if you're distracted, you're not gonna do it. If you're paying attention to the wrong thing, you're, not, you're gonna miss what the teacher said. You know, if you're impulsively running out to recess, you might not write it down. If you don't know where your pens and paper and day planner are, you might not write it down. If you're prioritizing poorly, if you lose track of it in your head while you're trying to like, get from, you're really trying, but by the time you figure out where things are, you've lost track of what the teacher said, you're not gonna write it down. And when you start problem solving it that way, you can realize that something as simple as like, why don't you write your homework in your day planner is actually a really complex executive function based task. And if we're going to help someone do it, it involves a pretty uh, detailed intervention sometimes trying to problem solve, like what exactly is getting in the way of writing it down. The other thing that's really important to recognize as executive function is executive function is the skill set we use to manage all of life. So it is a misperception to look at ADHD as a school problem. It turns out that executive function for most kids is where the demands are highest. So the issues may be most complex and most profound in school. And yet, ADHD is how we manage our chores. ADHD is how we manage our social lives, conversation. As we get older, driving. You know, ADHD has been linked with playground accidents. It's been linked with car accidents. It's been linked with obesity. It's been linked with really anything in life that requires management and coordination. So when we look at intervening for ADHD, the way we have to reframe things and what really what comprehensive care has to come down to is that ADHD, since it affects anything in life that requires management and coordination potentially, and everything in life requires management and coordination potentially, ADHD is a very complex and wide ranging medical condition that affects almost everything. So when we're supporting kids with ADHD and reframing ADHD to help you know, fully individuals and families who are struggling with it, we need to sort of open the lens initially to look at all of that. And then you know, hopefully that's not, it, when I said everything, I mean potentially everything. It doesn't always impact everybody that way, obviously. But we have to be open to the fact that almost any challenge going on may be impacted by executive function. You know, one thing I haven't said yet today, which because for this audience I didn't feel like I, I, I necessarily need to, is just the acknowledgement that you know, ADHD is a proven disorder in spite of how it's often talked about. You know, between the brain research we have, the genetic research that we have, 
you know, there's no doubt that ADHD really exists. You know, the rate of ADHD around the world is around 1 in 15 pretty much everywhere. The actual rate, not the diagnostic rate, that's a whole other discussion. So for an individual who has ADHD, we have to help them understand that, you know, they're spectacular, they're doing, you know, they have all these strengths and skills, and then this one skill set is really being undermined by having ADHD. When it comes to the impact of mindfulness, another level we have to think about as we're getting started and talking about mindfulness in a moment is recognizing that ADHD completely swamps parents. There is no way in my eyes to work with a child who has ADHD without bringing in the whole family. So research talks about how ADHD increases anxiety and depression in parents of kids with ADHD. There's a paper out of uh, uh, Pediatrics, the journal Pediatrics, that created a concept called decision-making angst, just the amount of choices parents are being asked to make all the time around their children's treatment is stressful with ADHD, their marriages are at risk for uh, breaking up, for stress, there's been studies doing, looking at things like confidence parents have in their own skills to change goes down, and one, I, think it, I don't know if it's one or two studies looked at uh, parents reporting fewer positive interactions with their own children, so ADHD has profound effects on parents, too. And one of the things I want you to start reflecting on as we start moving into mindfulness is, you know, what does it mean to start asking somebody who is feeling completely overwhelmed and swamped in that way to do anything around ADHD? How easy is it to stick to a new behavioral plan or to make a hard choice when you're feeling just completely wiped out? When you look at ADHD, executive function are the skills children use to become independent, too. You know, so kids with strong executive function are more likely to get out the door on time without a lot of your attention in the morning. But with kids with ADHD, they're just constantly requiring their parents' attention until we intervene. So there's a family-wide stress that's going on. And then the last thing I want to sort of put out there, because I think it's impossible not to mention it, is that on a community level, the perception of ADHD is often really stressful for parents and families, too. So what does it mean to be living some, with, with a condition that affects life so profoundly that you may not fully believe in because of the belief system, you know, sort of you've grown up around or have fallen into, that your parents may not believe in, that your neighbor might not believe in, you know, that moment when you sort of get the sense somebody's saying to you, like, why don't you just get your kid under control here, or why doesn't your kid just work harder, or, you know, how come, you know, she's not handing in her homework regularly, she should just hand it in already. And there's just this total dismissal of the condition itself sometimes that parents are living under. There's the fact that any time our children are misbehaving, it's sort of instinctual to feel a little judged when you're in a group or when you're in a community. And what we have with ADHD then is this very high level of just community internal, sort of internalized self-judgment or real direct community judgment about what's going on too which again is very unique to ADHD. No one's blaming any parent whose children have asthma or diabetes or you know, eczema, but parents are often feeling quite blamed when their children have struggles like this. Another aspect of care that's really um, confusing, and um, you know, I wish I had more time today to spend all my time talking just about managing ADHD, but there's an awful lot to say about that, is just recognizing that there is no cookie-cutter approach either. So it's like we can sort of lay out the fact that all these difficulties are there, and then we have to sort of uh, acknowledge the fact that we, we can't know ahead of time what's going to support any individual. And before I sort of transition to fully talking about mindfulness, I just wanted to sort of lay out, because I, I know from a couple of the questions I've gotten over the course of the last day that people are interested in this, that you know, there is no one thing that helps fully in treating ADHD. And the way I tend to look at ADHD care myself is that it's kind of like filling in a pie chart. You know, you just got to keep adding pieces until the whole thing's full for each individual. And there are different recommendations in different parts of the world about managing ADHD. Certainly in the United States, the recommendation is uh, clinically, the, the U.S. recommendation often starts with medication. You know, that's not something I really agree with fully. Um, but what's important in just the whole concept is knowing what all the options are and then making sure for any individual we get as full care into play as possible. So when you look at what supports children with ADHD overall, um, this is the way I kind of break it up in my head, and then it's a matter of just picking and choosing and making adjustments until we have everything covered. You know, I usually lead with the first two options on the chart, 
So educationally, you know, we really need to push for supports in school that acknowledge that you can be academically capable and yet struggling with executive function terribly. And that, I mean, literally on another level, you can, from a legal point of view, grades are not the bottom line in putting services in place for kids with ADHD. So struggling students need to be getting supports because they're struggling in terms of their grades and struggling students who are getting good grades but are still massively struggling because of internal issues like poor time management, stress, disorganization, also deserve supports. Um, so in terms of educational supports, my favorite kind of one-line summary of the whole thing is that forgetfulness is an ADHD symptom. Except in this case, what I, forgetfulness is kind of a metaphor for anything executive function related you can come up with. When it comes to forgetfulness, that means if you're punishing someone with ADHD over and over again by marking their grades down because they can't remember to get their homework handed in, you know, so you've now been marked down nine times for not handing your homework in, you know, in essence, you're just being punished for having ADHD. And ADHD directly affects planning, so kids with ADHD are rarely the ones who can come up with the plans to affect their own ADHD because executive function is the part of the brain we use to create new plans and problem solve. So in a school setting, it's the job of the adults to come up with solutions with the kids. It can be collaborative if the kids have reached that level of skill, but really there's no point to marking down their homework over and over again if they've proven to us that they don't know how to hand in their homework on time except that you want to think out of the box because that goes for anything related to executive function. If you're constantly being marked down on tests because you're careless, we have to come up with a way to teach you how to be less careless on tests because carelessness is an ADHD symptom. The second part of ADHD care, which again, all each of these could really be its own talk, we have to look at is that there's an awful lot that can happen at home to support executive function in kids. And I would say also executive function and resilience. There's research that suggests that kids with ADHD just get corrected all the time. And here's the problem. It's that because they have challenges in executive function, they need to get corrected all the time. You know, we can't not do that. So it often means that for parents of kids with ADHD, they need to be way more hyper-structured about their sort of behavioral management at home simply because that's what ADHD requires of them. We need to really focus on positive parenting techniques more than may come naturally, not because they're not loving parents, uh, you know, they all are, but because it just requires that level of attention to keep things focused on the positive when someone's having a hard time with executive function. You know, the flip side of that is that, again, and this is what the research suggests too, ADHD drives parents with ADHD, excuse me, ADHD drives parents of kids with ADHD away from the exact types of structure and limit setting that kids with ADHD benefit from because it doesn't seem to be working. So we have to problem solve that too. So the flip side of the positive parenting techniques is we have to problem solve why that's difficult because it's sort of intuitive that that makes sense but it's hard to do in real life and also look at on the limit setting side why that's so challenging and how to problem solve that because that's how you, part of how you develop executive function also. So the second part of uh, you know, ADHD care is what all of you are doing or many of you are doing. And it's partly parent training, and then of course cognitive behavioral therapy and behavioral therapy can help with a lot of these issues too. And often it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a trick question. People are often coming to talks like this about mindfulness and ADHD. You may already be wondering like, well, weren't somebody in here may already be wondering like, well, weren't you gonna teach me how to sort of focus my way out of ADHD by practicing mindfulness? And yet it's much broader than that. And in spite of all the evidence I'm gonna go over in a moment of the benefits of mindfulness, the reality is is the single most proven non-medical approach to ADHD is just therapy. You know, from a research point of view, behavioral therapy is a big piece of this pie often. The third piece of intervening for ADHD is around health routines. And uh, again, for today, I'm just gonna touch on it briefly, but just to say that ADHD undermines health routines because they're executive function based too in ways that make your ADHD worse. ADHD bites its own tail. So ADHD affects sleep, but better sleep makes your ADHD better. ADHD gets in the way of exercising regularly, you know, nutrition. All these things are affected too. And then the last part of ADHD I'm going to mention and then come back to mindfulness is just the recognition that when it comes to medication, you know, my view on it is simply objectivity. You know, these medications have been artificially demonized when used appropriately. You know, they're simply an option. They're one that have been shown to have lots of benefits for lots of people if they're used right without chronic side effects, if they're used well. 
you know, and it's really important to help, uh, you know, help thorough care, help people make intelligent choices, make skillful choices to just seek neutrality, objectivity. No one should use a medication they don't need in life ever, but these medications are not what people make them out to be when they're used appropriately. And they can be profoundly beneficial for many, many people when they're used well, if they're correctly diagnosed with ADHD. And, the, you know, and that is kind of like ADHD management in a nutshell. You know, again, all for another day to go into the details of each of those parts. But there's obviously a lot of complexity to it, and what I want to come back to now is really looking at, for today's topic, like what is mindfulness and why is that going to support that whole big picture of ADHD care? So the perception is changing, but a lot of the times when people think about mindfulness, they think about something like this. So the slide says, are we there yet? For, you know, up here in the corner, the poster says, the journey to enlightenment. And it's interesting, because when I started giving talks like this, um, you know, before mindfulness was so sort of out there in the open, um, there was a different perception of this cartoon, I think, of just like people really did think this is what mindfulness was about. And yet there's still an important message to this slide, particularly when you're working with kid, uh, parents and kids of, uh, who have ADHD, which is that even though I think people now get that mindfulness is secular or we're not trying to get to enlightenment, there still often is a perception that mindfulness means some type of perfection. You know, that we're doing mindfulness because, you know, we're going to be always calm, so I could never do that. Or we're going to have a totally still mind so that, you know, no way, my mind is never still. And really, one of the quickest ways to undermine mindfulness practice is to go in with that perception, that comparison of like, yeah, you know, I'm I, really the reason to practice mindfulness is because suddenly I'm going to be this image of perfection, always calm under stress, which is just garbage. It's impossible. It's not what we're aiming for. And if you can just move past that sense of perfection, that's going to help establish a practice that's more sustainable. But really, mindfulness has something to do with this slide. And really, the starting point for mindfulness is really in summarized right here just perfectly. Because the beginning point in thinking about mindfulness is simply understanding how the mind works. And how the mind works is this. We have life going on in front of us all the time, and yet our mind rarely stays there for very long. You know, you're all here, hopefully, to learn from some of the things that I'm saying, and yet none of you have fully paid attention to everything I've said yet, because that's not what the mind does. And whatever we're doing, our mind is skipping ahead to the future, or falling back into the past, or ruminating, or fantasizing, all of which is going to persist no matter how we practice. But when we become more aware of that pattern, become aware of that habit, we can start to work with it differently. Because in spite of the fact that it's kind of routine, it's also not without meaning in life. Anytime we're doing something without giving it our full attention, you know, on a very surface level, for one thing, we often do miss out on things that we might otherwise be enjoying. And one of the concepts in mindfulness is just understanding habits of mind, understanding the way the mind works. You know, it's so much the mind, like negative things are stickier. It's a safety mechanism. And it's really easy, like, to go for a run, which could be relaxing for me. I'm, you know, I, I jog for, you know, for that, that's sort of one of my outlets. And it's really easy to go for a run and just not even be on the run the whole time, just to be caught up in a work problem or caught up in a family problem. So part of it has to do with that superficial level, but much more importantly is a really black and white concept that is the core of working with mindfulness, which is anytime we're doing something without giving it our attention, we're almost by definition on autopilot. We're just living by habit, we're saying the same things we've always done, we're reacting in the same ways we always react because we're not giving it enough attention to make a choice. And that goes with how we deal with ourselves and how we think of ourselves, it goes with how we problem solve, certainly goes with how we talk to our children. One of my favorite moments of, uh, from uh, I, when I'm working with, I, I'm a, uh, doing a mindful parent class uh, from years ago, I remember, is a mom who was you know, taking a class and she had been fighting with her uh, teenager who never ever cleaned up his room, just chronically, she said. And what she said was, is, you know, one day what I did was, I was walking up the stairs to yell at him about his room again. Or maybe she said to have a discussion with him, but yeah, and, and, but on her way up, up the stairs, I realized I just caught myself. You know, she was about three weeks into the class, and she said, I caught myself. You know, I took a few breaths, I settled again, and I realized I was just about to have the same conversation again, or the same shouting match again, and I just went back downstairs. And then she said, well, and then what happened was, is like over a week or two, his room became increasingly messy, was driving me crazy, 
And then after about two or three weeks, he cleaned his room. He didn't clean it very well. He didn't clean it like I would have, but it was cleaned. And that's a good example of just this concept of like, if we can just get out of autopilot, we can start breaking those patterns. We can start breaking those habits, often by choosing not to do something instead of doing something. So what then is mindfulness? Like, you know, there, there is this sort of academic def definition of it. I'd really, uh, one of the things I always call on people to do is as I'm talking about mindfulness, if anything I say sounds either new agey, I'm very triggered by that. I lived in Berkeley for too long, so I don't want to hear any of that. So if it sounds either new agey or not really practical in every day, I haven't explained it very well. So I want you to, you know, you can all just call me for that, call, on, call it out. But there is an academic, sorry, for research purposes almost definition, which is this idea of moment by moment, non-judgmental awareness with less reactive habit. And we're not saying that we're ever going to do that perfectly, we're just trying to do it more. We're trying to acknowledge this state of constant distractibility and work with that. So what does this mean we're dealing with mindfulness? It means that through everyday practice, so through meditation typically, we're aiming to build traits. So again, start like putting aside the cliches. Meditation is not a way to relax. It is often relaxing, but the real intention of mindfulness practice is simply to reinforce traits. Every time we're sitting and practicing focus, we get a little better at, at being focused. A really subtle thing that's going on is every time we sit and practice, for a few minutes, it actually can be uncomfortable, and we're practicing just sitting with that discomfort a little bit. Not that we might not be more proactive some other part of the day, but we're practicing not being reactive almost directly. So we want to separate out these sort of goals in everyday life of being more moment-to-moment -moment aware, so we can create choice and opportunity and appreciate what's going well. The non-judgmental awareness part, that is one of those sort of like hard words to understand. Like sound judgment is really useful in life. You know, we're not talking about never having any judgments, not knowing you like chocolate ice cream versus vanilla ice cream, things like that. It just means seeing things clearly. It just means recognizing this is factually what's going on. So when I work with ADHD, for example, the idea that we can clearly see why a child is having difficulty, even before anything else changes, often makes a huge difference. So to use that forgetfulness example again, you know, if you're working with a teen with ADHD and realize all right, now he's been diagnosed with ADHD, and suddenly realized that all that forgetfulness of his schoolwork isn't because he doesn't care and isn't trying hard enough and isn't unmotivated. It's purely because he has ADHD. You know, that's non-judgmental awareness. It doesn't make the problem go away, but it totally changes how you address the issue. Or if you look at the morning routine, you know, that's an example I use with parents a lot. One of the ways to look at AD, uh, executive function in early childhood sometimes is just to imagine someone's just a little younger than they are. So you have a nine-year-old who's completely brilliant, but their self-management skills might be more like a five-year-old. And then non-judgmental awareness in that moment might be recognizing, well, like before we fix this problem, in the morning, his skills are more like a five-year-old. So I have to treat, you know, I have to get more involved with the mornings again. How would I have approached this when he was in kindergarten? Non-judgmental awareness, by the way, also includes being okay with the fact that that's really frustrating as a parent and not judging yourself because the reality of it is is that's more demanding and exhausting as a parent too. So the part of mindfulness that has to do with non-judgmental awareness is just trying to see life with more clarity, trying to see that we all have our own mental stuff that we get caught up in, we all have habits, we all have patterns, and the more realistically we can see that, the more we can start working with that. So that when we look at mindfulness through that lens, it's not about the meditation practice. The meditation practice is a way of sort of building skills. It's about trying to live life in a different way. So mindfulness practice is kind of like physical exercise. And that's an important thing to remember too, if any of you are involved in school-based programs, if any of you are you know, working with clients. It's all well and good to introduce things in dribs and drabs. It's kind of like planting seeds. But in the big picture, if you want to practice mindfulness and make a change with mindfulness, it's all just about repeating it and doing it over and over again. Kind of like, it's kind of like mental fitness instead of physical fitness. It's all just about building these traits that are going to help us manage life differently. And both with mindfulness and around ADHD, a lot of that starts with really understanding stress in a kind of more subtle way. And just to give you guys a heads up, because you know, I think you can only talk about mindfulness so much before you just do mindfulness. We're going to do a practice in a minute or two. But one of the things that is really uh, vital to recognize, first of all, you know, ADHD causes a lot of stress. I've already alluded to that. 
But stress is not something that is um, you know, so neutral in everyday life. A little bit of stress is part of our motivation. You, know, you never want to get in a cab with a cab driver who feels no stress because it's really dangerous. You, know, you want stress to keep you motivated a little bit. You want stress to keep you, you know, safe. And yet, if we don't take the time to manage stress, it's kind of like a snow globe. Stress just perpetuates more stress. Because when we are stressed, we think differently. Our bodies feel differently. When our bodies feel rotten, that changes how we think and feel. And it's just this cycle that just perpetuates itself all day long. You know, people often describe the fight or flight stress as the fight or flight response, but really it's more accurately looked at as fight, flight, or freeze. Meaning that under stress, you know, when we're in danger, or our body perceives we're in danger, we don't want to be thinking clearly. We just want to act. You know, we don't want to be sort of weighing different options and thinking out of the box. We're just in purely reactive mode, which may be exactly what we need. We just need to leap out of the way. But of course, in everyday life, we don't want to be living that way all the time. So chronic stress undermines our physical health. It undermines our mental health. It pushes us back onto old patterns, you know, which may be undermining our mental health again. All these things are impacted by it. And as parents and providers, it's important to recognize that simply, you know, there, there's no way of avoiding the fact that adult stress impacts child stress. I mean, one of the questions I often get when I'm talking about mindfulness and ADHD care right up front is how do you teach this to kids? And yet there's no getting around the fact that it starts from adult practice. You know, kids learn from how people around them are living. But as a bottom line, why did stress evolve? You know, stress evolved as a safety mechanism. Stress evolved because at moments in life we're under attack just like this. You know, we need this response if we are physically in danger. But in the modern world, stress is really often just a perception. So there will be no quiz on this slide. Nobody take notes on this, please. But what this slide is supposed to be showing is that there is this really complicated stress response in life. Your body does all sorts of things when it thinks it's in danger. Your blood moves away from things like digestion, into your muscles so you can run and fight and take care of yourself and changes how we think and all of this is true. And then that cycle goes on of like, you know, our emotional state changes how we, so like there are studies, for example, showing things like when we're angry, we're more likely to interpret the actions of other people as angry, which of course then feeds back on itself. And if our body feels rotten, that changes how we perceive the world. And all these things are playing off of each other all the time. And yet so, so often they're just triggered by thoughts like, you know, I'm running late. You know, oh, I wonder what she thinks of me. You know, I'm not quite sure what she said there. My child will never, you know, there are all these thoughts going on all the time that are triggering this response and then just setting off this cascade that can take over life. And something like that 15 breaths practice sometimes just serves to do nothing more than to give us a moment than to shut off what is practically speaking an on-off switch. You know, there is no subtlety to stress. It is the same stress response that's going to be triggered whether we just feel rotten or we're a little annoyed about homework or whether we're in actual danger. This is just what the brain does. So what we want to start doing is to work with that. We want to break that cycle. We want to let ourselves settle. We want to be aware of the different thoughts that are triggering ourselves so that on a fundamental level at the beginning of mindfulness we're talking about just getting out of autopilot, getting out of inflexible thinking, and trying to increase our own capacity to live life more skillfully. And that's really what we're working with with mindfulness. It's why it integrates so naturally with the types of therapy everybody's doing here. It doesn't necessarily replace any other part of therapy, but by settling, by being less judgmental about habits we have, we can often start working with them differently. And then the last thing in terms of just defining mindfulness I want to touch on, because I think it is so, um, you know, it's just a different way to engage people. You know, I think if there's a lot of people who are just interested in mindfulness because it all sounds intuitive that this might be useful in life. I guess I haven't said it so directly yet. I mean, the core premise of mindfulness really isn't about perfection. It's actually about the opposite. The core premise of it all, the reason the whole practice developed is that life is kind of inherently unsettling and changing at times. And our well-being really relies a lot on how skillfully we navigate that. You know, so that really the premise of mindfulness is how can we work on the traits that help us navigate the challenges of life more easily. But on a scientific level, like if you want to get a school to buy in or a client to buy in, um, or on a personal level stay motivated, I think it's useful to know just a little bit about the science too. The starting point of which is the idea of neuroplasticity. 
which isn't what I was taught in medical school. You know, there used to be a thought that the brain was fairly stagnant. It just kind of did it, you know, once it developed, it was just there. We now know that anything we do repetitively, mentally, rewires the brain at any age. So as a senior citizen, if you learn an instrument, for example, you can show growth in parts of the brain related to playing that instrument. But on a level that ties more directly to mindfulness, what it means is that you can show changes related to practicing focus, for example. If you practice focus consistently, parts of the brain related to focus seem to develop in strength. To emotion, to even compassion, which is really an abstract concept. So one of the things I think we need to think about differently, I think for this generation in particular, I mean, one of the reasons I think mindfulness is having its little moment in the sun right now is that we need it. It isn't the world we're living in. I think 50 years ago, a lot of the things, you know, the sort of the traits related to mindfulness were just more a part of our lives. And now you have to look at the fact that, you know, we're being pushed into all sorts of reactivity and things that might need more of our direct attention. What got me up here speaking about mindfulness really has to do with this slide. So that's your moment of mindfulness. Now come back to the talk. This slide actually, uh, which is a summary of the research publications coming out around mindfulness, actually also describes how come I'm up here talking about mindfulness personally, because I was fortunate somewhere around here when I started residency training to be introduced to mindfulness individually. You know, one of my mentors in the pediatric clinic introduced me to it. I found it really useful, started practicing myself, really kept it to myself. And then somewhere in, in more in here, what ha really happened was is the science started coming out. And I went to a couple of really fascinating conferences about stress management and neuroplasticity and the benefits of mindfulness. And then um, what has happened is, and I just feel fortunate that the timing worked for me personally, is I really just decided, among many of us, is that the, you know, the, the balance of evidence has tipped. We now know that mindfulness has benefits across many aspects of life. And for anyone who's really intently interested in the research, clearly it's a, you know, it's a beginning field. You know, there's much more research that needs to happen, and you don't want to overcall anything. I would say personally, sometimes the, the simplest way to look at all of mindfulness research is that it's not snake oil. It's not that mindfulness cures anything in particular. On some level, at least, it's just the acknowledgement that chronic stress undermines everything. So like, you know, when you start looking at studies like, that have done things like look at mindfulness and rheumatoid arthritis, it's like, well, probably it's not directly affecting rheumatoid arthritis. But if we're managing our own well-being and managing chronic stress, it is changing things likely that affect your, your, you know, how that chronic medical disorder is happening. A more nuanced way of looking at it, too, might be, by the way, which relates back to an aspect of ADHD that doesn't get talked about a lot, is that in some studies, ADHD has been shown to increase the cost of treating other medical conditions, which may have to do with just stress and executive function, because you're just less likely to stay on top of your own health care. So all these things add up. But when you look at this research, it covers a very wide swath of our day-to-day -day lives. So mindfulness has been shown to help with our overall well-being and anxiety. It's used in England as a complement to tradition. It's part of actually government health in England for the treatment of depression, because there's a program called Mindfulness. They need a, this is a program in serious need of an acronym, but the program is called Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for the Treatment of Depression. But it's a very well-established program. For any of you who are clinicians, they have a very nice clinician manual, which really shows how, not, how to integrate mindfulness into cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's been shown to be as effective as medication for some types of depression, not all depression, so you know, be careful about that, but for some types of depression. It's been shown to help with various physical conditions, like I mentioned, including increased response to uh, vaccines in a couple of studies. It's been shown to um, help with chronic pain. So mindfulness is really, there's a lot of implications that it may have broad effects on life. Um, and really fascinating, like I alluded to, there's actual research showing that it physically changes our brains. Um, and for anyone interested in delving into this more, there's two really good books, one older and one newer on the science of mindfulness. Um, there's a, the, the older version is called um, Train Your Brain, Change Your Mind. Or uh, I might have it's on my website. Uh, it's Patrick, um, the author is Begley. Um, and then more recently, uh, Richie Davidson and a couple of people came out with a book called Altered Traits, which is sort of a summary of some of the better controlled studies of mindfulness. And again, this is the end of the science for this talk. I just want to kind of 
talk about mindfulness after this, but just recognizing that this can happen over very short amounts of time. So this is a study of the traditional eight-week MBSR program. MBSR stands for Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And after just eight weeks of this program, and one of the most amazing things all of you are probably aware of is like no one can actually say that anybody in the program is following the program exactly. So whatever people would have done in terms of actually doing their mindfulness practice, after eight weeks of this study, this is from Sarah Lazar at Harvard, um, this demonstrates physical growth in areas of the brain responsible for emotional management. So, and this is actually one of the places where the uh, ADHD community started buying into mindfulness at all, is even before there was acceptance that it might be useful. Uh, what they showed is, uh, you know, there's a, that emotional aspect, there, there was a sort of sense that that emotional aspect of mindfulness clearly crosses over to helping people with the emotional aspect of ADHD. But then there's a last thing I want to say before doing uh, mindfulness practice right now, which is that mindfulness also is not really a self-help program. And that's really important to, set, to really set out there too. You know, people are, uh, especially parents, it's often like this sense of like, well, I don't have time to take care of myself and my kids come first. <clears throat> but in reality, there's a broader premise to the practice of mindfulness, which is this. The, the thing we need to just look at sometimes is that when we're more settled and living more skillfully ourselves, that profoundly affects how we're relating to everyone around us. And the bigger implications of the practice of mindfulness are that we're practicing not for our own sakes alone, but because by taking this time to take care of ourselves, it then is something we're going to give back to everyone around us in essence. Not even literally necessarily, but just it's going to happen that everyone around us is going to benefit in different ways. And I think you can see that on, I mean, that's, a, I would imagine, intuitive. But you can imagine in almost any situation, you know, you can look at a situation where, like, a child is flying totally off the handle. And, you know, at the same time, we can't do anything directly to change that. You know, the only thing we influence in that moment is what we choose to do next. So it doesn't mean it's our fault that that's going on, and it doesn't mean it's not a really difficult situation. And yet our capacity to stay settled and try to act skillfully in that moment clearly is going to affect you know, what direction it goes. Or on a more nuanced level, and I say this, you know, this is not you know, hoping to create any uh, perception of perfection, like we're all going to screw up at times you know, when you think about it this way. But there also is the reality that you know, how we interact with our kids changes how they interact with other kids, just in little ways. You know, if our kids go onto the bus having had a really positive interaction with us, that might change how they act on the bus compared to if they were fighting with us. You know, and these little things add up. So this study that I have up here, Why the Stickers, um, Richie Davidson's lab has a program called the Kindness Curriculum. Uh, and the basic setup in this study is in, um, Actually, I want to ask Lonnie something. Can I run over a little bit? I just want to make sure, because I can, just a few minutes. I don't want to, OK, because I don't want to have to shorten the back end of the talk. So when you look at the kindness curriculum, the kindness curriculum, they, uh, what they do is, before the study, they have kids give out stickers to um, pictures of other kids so they don't actually hurt anyone's feelings. And the way that works is they sort of say, like, here's 10 stickers. Here's a picture of someone you like, someone you don't like, and one you've never seen. You know, how can we, you know, why don't you just give these stickers out? So they do. And of course, for kids, stickers are gold. And you would imagine that in the preschool set, all the stickers go to their friend initially. And then they do the kindness curriculum. And by the end of the program, they distribute the stickers equally. And that type of behavioral change to the practice of mindfulness has been shown all the way through adults who are more likely to, after practicing mindfulness, give up their seats to someone in need, give a small amount of money to charity. Uh, and like I alluded to earlier, it actually has been shown to physically affect the brain as well. But you can't just talk about mindfulness, so I just want to take a moment then to really demonstrate what I'm talking about a little bit, and then sort of end the talk by integrating that concept of mindfulness into all of ADHD care. So what I'd like you to do again is take a moment to set down whatever is in your hands. <clears throat> and it's often useful to Note your posture as you get started, just because it's, if nothing else, very hard to stay alert and still. If you don't have a balanced and upright posture, so placing your feet on the floor, sitting up straight, letting your gaze drop. And 
And then bring your attention now again to that physical sensation of breathing, breathing in and breathing out. And you might even label that mentally, breathing in and breathing out. And almost immediately your mind probably goes somewhere else. And that's totally normal. So inherent to the whole practice is just recognizing that that's going to happen. And just coming back once more, breathing in and breathing out. You don't have to do anything with your breath. You're not trying to make yourself feel any particular way. Just patiently noting each distraction, each time something grabs your attention. And coming back again. might even notice a sense of reactivity already. This could never work. This would be great. I'm never going to be able to. All those types of thoughts are just thoughts. And each time you notice that, again, just note it as a thought and come back to the next breath. wanders almost constantly and you come back just once, that's perfect. And when you're ready, opening your eyes. I've often found it kind of um, profound and uh, and I don't know what word to use exactly, just to just note that often when I'm leading mindfulness for people with ADHD, <coughs> someone asks the question, like, you know, there's this instruction in mindfulness of, you know, the distractions are going to happen, don't worry about it, just come back. You know, don't judge yourself for getting distracted, it happens. You know, is that something that you instruct for everybody, or is that just, you know, for this ADHD group? And it's actually kind of moving often when they realize, like, actually, that's just part of the practice. Like, everybody gets distracted. It just may be a little harder if you have ADHD. So what, then, does mindfulness bring into ADHD care? You know, there's many, many things we can look at and ways that we can use these mindfulness practices to support all of ADHD care. The broader view I bring towards, you know, I think that's important to take towards mindfulness and ADHD is this. There's an aspect of mindfulness practice over time that has to do with focus and staying settled. We can practice being focused more often, and we can practice staying settled under stress. There's a really important part of it that has to do with objectivity, seeing life with clarity. You know, not getting caught up in what ADHD, you know, what we think ADHD is or isn't, or what we don't want to deal with but really just seeing things with clarity, accepting things as they are. And then the last part has to do with judgment and being compassionate with ourselves. So I want to end today just kind of by pulling that all together, recognizing, like as I said, that really a lot of people when they hear about mindfulness and ADHD, the question often comes up, you know, can I just practice focusing enough that I'm going to be able to focus, that I won't have ADHD anymore? 
And I'm going to talk about research on focus and attention in just a moment, but the reality is, is no one's done any research yet saying that you can just practice mindfulness to the point that you don't have ADHD anymore. Far more profoundly as a starting point, we can just recognize that ADHD creates an awful lot of stress and distress. That stress itself is going to get in the way of taking care of ADHD because everything you're being asked to do when you have ADHD is harder when you're feeling chronically swamped. And really, in many ways, the starting point for practicing mindfulness in ADHD is just the acknowledgement that we need to work on getting our feet solidly on the floor before we can really fully take over ADHD care. You know, how can we manage behavior effectively and consistently if we haven't taken care of ourselves enough to be feeling good enough to do something that's really, really hard? So mindfulness as a practice, like we talked about, helps with stress and anxiety and manage uncertainty. And certainly the beginning point for why mindfulness so profoundly supports ADHD care really starts here. We build our own resiliency. We get out of reactive mode. We maybe flexibly problem solve differently. We cut down on feelings of burnout maybe. And the heart of getting started, the platform for everything often comes down to this. I mean, one of the things I think that's under-acknowledged, for example, is a good starting point for ADHD care is often to really fine-tune behavioral management at home, not because parents are doing anything right or wrong, but because they often need many, many more tools than most of us go into parenting with, to being parents with, because ADHD requires it, and yet they all require a lot of persistence and effort. So coupling that effort to start a new behavioral plan with mindfulness often gives people the capacity to just take that a little farther. When it comes to this first part of, of mindfulness, of focus and settling, staying settled is part of it. And then there's the question of like, well, what about teaching focus directly? And I think that's an important piece too. You know, can we use mindfulness to augment that aspect of care? And the answer is, is absolutely. And again, more research is needing, needed, but certainly mindfulness has been studied within ADHD also. So this is a slide from my friend Lydia Zalowska's work. She was the first person, to, you know, she had, to, she had to answer a very basic research question initially, which is just, can people with mindfulness even do this stuff? So she did a pilot study initially looking at about 20-something people, uh, young adults and adolescents with ADHD, and really everyone finished the course. Everyone rep self-reported benefits from the course. It was modified, the practices were shorter, there was more support in sort of structurally remembering to do the practices. And then this is also a slide uh, measuring uh, a test of executive function, showing that among just those few people, 22 people, she was able to show statistical improvements in attention and executive function. And again, while there's, in this specific aspect of the research, there's a whole lot more we need to know. There haven't been that many studies. Um, there have been enough studies that there's already, already been one meta-analysis, meaning they gathered those studies and really showed that there's a sense that even with ADHD, you can find benefits for stress, anxiety, attention, probably decreased ADHD symptoms overall, emotional skills improve. So there is an ability to go in there and actually work with ADHD directly through the practice of mindfulness. But to me right now, it has more to do with the pie chart of like it's another useful piece. I think from a research point of view, I have one thing that I've always been interested in, which is just that there are more intensive practices and in mindfulness out there where people go off and do like two, three week retreats and things like that. And that hasn't been studied yet. So on the one hand, we can say that in shorter programs that involve you know, more like real life 10 or 15 minutes at a time interventions, we can't undo ADHD through mindfulness. It would be interesting to know what happens through more intensive practices. Some of the more successful ways of going after mindfulness are classroom-based programs, and I just wanted to point out that while there often is an implication that there's like demographically this is you know, only for a certain part of our country, it's being studied in several inner city programs with benefits as well. Really the heart of mindfulness and often the heart of working with ADHD is just recognizing the implications of habit on life. And uh, the, um, the target on the slide here refers to just marketing research in general, which shows that you know, one of the things, one of the reasons marketing works is because they've shown that if they could grab our shopping habits in any aspect of life, those habits don't generally change until we have a new upheaval in life. So like if we're shopping for baby stuff and they can grab our habits, we're just gonna stick with them. And maybe in the q and I'll come back to why, I mean, this particular research has a lot of other implications. But even within that swath of research, 
the really interesting implication that ties to mindfulness is they've shown that if you can just remind somebody that that's a habit, they're likely to change that habit. And really, if we're going to change how we live in any aspect of life, we need to be open to the fact that those habits exist. We all have different ways of dealing with stress and dealing with our children and speaking and shopping and all these things in life. And the only way to change those habits is to pause long enough to examine them and just recognize that they are habits. So for example, around ADHD, the moment we can drop the assumption that forgetfulness is happening because of lack of caring, but because of executive function, a lot changes. And there's many, many layers of implication to this, which I can't get into fully you know, just in today's format. But really, the heart of mindfulness is recognizing that these types of habits can be all-consuming. So the negativity bias is one most of us are familiar with in life, and certainly as parents, which is that there's this kind of hardwired safety mechanism that says that anything that seems dangerous and off just sticks with us. It's why like, you can actually have a day which, if you were to examine it, like 18 or 20 things went really well, but that one thing you said just a little off keeps you up at night. Actually, my wife gives me a hard time for that all the time because when I play sports, I'm consumed by that. You know, you can have a really, really good game and then you make one mistake, which at my age happens all the time, and then that's what sticks with you. But if you can recognize that as, like a, as a mental pattern, a mental habit, you can start working with it differently. You can start pushing back against the negativity bias, not in an unrealistic way. You know, those things are important too, but focusing on the positive as well. Certainly, reframing ADHD in this way changes all of ADHD care. Even, the, even really hard decisions like, should I use the medication or not use the medication? I think that's a totally individual decision. But you want to cut through assumptions, you want to see things factually, you know, and you just want to make a decision. You know, no one should use a medication they don't need, but you want to look at things factually. And then you can look at specific aspects of care, like mindfulness fully integrates with traditional behavioral programs. You know, you can think about the fact that most behavioral programs, for example, start with just pay positive attention to your child, which seems like the easiest thing in the world, except that on a busy, reactive morning on autopilot, got to get out the door in 10 minutes, what's going on here? It's really easy to just forget to give any positive feedback at all, right up until that moment when you're getting into the car and say, where the hell is your backpack? So you can start practicing mindfulness and begin to realize that there might be room to say, like, nice job brushing your teeth, nice job doing that, and then as you're getting into the car, where the hell is your backpack? <laughs> but at least you've started to give that type of targeted praise and positive feedback, too. Or simply giving our children full attention can be almost its own mindfulness practice. Our children know when we're busy and on our phones and not really paying attention and half at work instead of at the dinner table or playing a game with them. And we can take the same concept of like non-judgmental awareness to realizing like we all have our, our hang-ups when it comes to setting limits. We all get caught up in different stuff. And we can just sort of non-judgmental awareness. Like what is it, you know, I really would, you know, this whole bedtime thing isn't going so well. You know, what is it that I could bring differently to it? And then what I want to end with is just reflecting on really the elephant in the room when it comes to mindfulness, which is that there is an awful lot of judgment when it comes to mindfulness. And I'm not talking just about community judgment. One of the best one-line summaries of mindfulness ever is Russell Barkley, who said, it's not a disorder of not knowing what to do. It's a disorder of not doing what you know. So what does it mean to grow up probably knowing exactly what all the adults around you really think you should be doing, but because of your poor executive function, you're not doing that consistently. You're setting out to do well and then just getting in your own way. All of us live with this other mental habit called the inner critic. Everyone has it differently, which is this voice that just says, you should be better, you should have done this, you're not good enough, whatever. It's different for everybody in different ways. It's often very closely tied into perfectionism. And yet, it's really harsh. It's not how we would treat someone we really cared about. But when you have ADHD, that voice can take over to the point where like, every time you try to take on a new plan, it immediately is saying, you're never going to do it. It's not going to work. So another very profound part of mindfulness practice is very different than most of the way most of us were raised. It's not traditionally uh, really thought of, I think, in traditional Western psychology either, is the fact that we can directly just work on Compassion, and that always starts with ourselves, meaning that if we can shift to the point where we're treating ourselves mentally no differently than we would a close friend, 
It tends to not only make us feel better, not only treat other people differently, but helps with motivation and persistence. So this comes from Kristen Neff's work on self-compassion. That that profoundly changes everything and often lets us go after our own ADHD differently. You know, how would you advise a friend in the same situation? Well, you'd probably say like, yeah, it's hard. Let's work on this together. We can do this. Don't worry about it. Everyone makes a mistake. What can we do next? But our own inner message to ourselves may be nothing like that at all. So Kristen Neff's self-compassion practice she's developed, and I'm going to end with something like this today, so we don't have, I'm not going to do it right now, I'm going to come back to it, is that in any moment you can try to shift your perspective just through practice, like we've been talking about. And the message that we, uh, that she's, the sort of the format she's created is, you can just notice, like, this is a moment of struggle. This is a moment of difficulty. We all have them. This isn't unique to me. And then an out, the out-breath, the words aren't important. It's just that sense of, like, what would, you, what would you offer back to a friend right now? May I find some kindness for myself in this moment? And this is where it can really, I know, start to sound very different, New Agey, Berkeley, too much Berkeley. And yet it's meant to be very practical. It's real. It's not like everything's all good. It's not that you don't have to go out and try to take care of things about yourself you want to improve on. It's just a recognition that we can shift our perspective and do it in a kinder way. And then, you know, from there, it sort of grows out to the recognition that that's kind of how everyone's living. So that when our children are struggling, we can realize that that doesn't come from the fact that they're trying to be difficult. It comes from the fact that they're struggling with something. You know, you can think almost of like that moment of throwing a complete tantrum in the store because they have to have that candy. You know, it's just in that moment, that's what they think is going to bring them happiness. And we can find some compassion even while we say no. And we can find compassion for them. Like, the answer is still no, although I know you want it. And we might not literally say that, but we can at least recognize that. And then we can find some serious compassion for ourselves too and realize like, wow, am I under stress here? This is miserable. I hate that this is going on. And then just you know, try to find some way to get our feet back on the floor of like, may I just find some solidity here in this really difficult moment? Instead of what's often going on, which is everyone's looking at me. I never get this right. Why is my kid? All these things take over that are just adding on to an already difficult situation. So when you tie all that together, you really have this sort of integrated approach to supporting this whole big package of what ADHD brings to the world. Managing the stress of it, managing the minutia of it, the day-to-day -day care of it, how do we fine-tune a behavioral program, and working with compassion. And what that looks like in everyday life, I'm going to leave mostly for the Q&A, but I wanted to just touch on it. And then we'll do a practice and then the Q&A, which is to say that as I alluded to at the beginning, it's not about teaching one thing. It's about an overall lifestyle in which you integrate some formal practices for mindfulness, which can be movement practices, which can be lots of different things, particularly in young kids. There are informal practices in mindfulness we can integrate into everyday life. You can make a mindfulness practice almost every, almost, out of almost anything. You can do those 15 breaths-like practices in the moment. You can do mindfulness like if you're a parent and you're like, your day is so pressured. You can take three minutes to eat a snack with mindfulness, just as a way to settle again, to refocus yourself. I'm going to come to the stop practice next, but the stop practice is just a way to catch yourself during the day. That's the next slide I'm going to show, the 15 breaths practice I demonstrated. The classroom bell can be used that way, but it's also something you can do in a classroom. You just ring the bell, and everyone raises their hand when they've heard the bell, in essence. And it's just a way of settling things again. The stop practice stands for stop what you're doing, Take a few breaths, observe, just check in with what's going on mentally, literally, and then pick what to do next. So when I'm working with physicians, for example, I encourage them to just do this practice every time you put your hand on a doorknob, every time you're switching new rooms. Just stop, gather your attention one more time, you know, and then bring your full attention to that next interaction. With kids, you can do it around homework. Like, you know, why doesn't homework get in the backpack? It's not because they don't know it doesn't go there. It's just because they got distracted. Before you get up from the table, stop a second, you know, take a few breaths. You can build mindfulness into bedtime. It's one of the best ways, to easiest ways to introduce it to kids. Eating in ADHD can be disordered. All these different things start to integrate together. 
And really, you know, with this broader goal of just seeing ADHD with clarity, you know, recognizing its broader implications both for us as adults and for kids, you know, acknowledging all of that, and then with compassion, sort of integrating it into that overall approach to just addressing ADHD fully. So what I'd like to do in ending just for a minute is just a second, a different practice, similar but not exactly the one that Kristen Neff introduced there. And then I'm happy to stay as long to go back to any of the things I touched on more briefly. But, but again, find yourself a comfortable posture for a minute. So place your feet flat on the floor again and close your eyes. And just start for a moment just to gather your attention by focusing on the breath again initially. Notice wherever your mind is right now with patience. There's nothing to be done about it. And just come back to the breath as best as you're able. And then if you'd like, opening up that practice just a little so that on each in-breath, just bring to the in-breath a sense of awareness. Just this is everything that's going on for me right now. Just noticing thoughts, emotions, body, sounds, just, you know, just in a very open way. This is my experience right now. And then in each out-breath, focusing on what you'd most wish for and what you'd most want to offer yourself in this moment. Maybe a sense of strength or solidity or humor or lightness. And quite importantly, that's not because you're going to make yourself feel anything in particular. It's just kind of a signpost. Just kind of offering yourself the same wishes you would a friend or a child. With each in-breath awareness, and with each out-breath setting yourself that intention. Ready, opening your eyes. So thank you everybody for your attention today. Often those practices bring up thoughts and reactions and so if anyone has, you know, I'm going to stick around for questions as long as anyone has them. Um, but I appreciate your participation today and um, there's a lot of resources, just I didn't want to go into all that during the talk. I have sections on my website, some listed here about how to do all this, but um, thank you again for being here. Hi, good morning. Um, good morning. My question has to do with intergenerational ADHD, mm -hmm. so the difficulty of um, implementing these changes with children and families right. when the parent themselves is struggling with these exact same issues. Sure. Um, actually, I would say intergenerational ADHD is the rule of ADHD, not the exception. <laughs> the genetics of ADHD are actually close to the genetics of height. So um, actually, I think you're always working with families when you're working with ADHD. Um, so um, that understanding of some of the difficulties parents may be having 
is just inherent to the whole plan, I think. So, um, so there isn't a more specific answer than that, except that uh, that's how you have to work with all of it. So if you're trying to create a new behavioral plan for a child, you have to understand and work with the parent first. Or if you want a new homework routine, it's always, when you're working with families, an intervention that has to just acknowledge how everybody's doing, in essence. So um, it's a great question, um, but it actually is inherently part of ADHD for almost all families. Not all, but many or most. Susan, on your side. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you. Do you have resources or suggestions for middle age kid, middle school age kids for them to have a book or a podcast or an app or something that helps them learn what you've shared with us today? Um, the question is like how to teach a middle schooler. And the answer is, um, at that age, it's still mostly, I mean, one of the fundamental parts of ADHD you have to understand is that if you are the person, I mean, you may understand this, one, people, I don't mean you specifically, people, you know, when we're dealing with ADHD, is that since ADHD so profoundly affects planning, really all the way through middle school, typically most of the interventions are kind of very top down. You know, parents and teachers create the structure that kids are learning from. Because if you're the person with ADHD, this actually goes all the way through adulthood for some people. If you're the person with ADHD, it's really hard to do anything related to ADHD. So I would say um, it's less about like a middle schooler taking on their own care as about a parent and their teachers establishing the plans that are going to help them learn from those plans most often. So as far as I'm aware, there isn't actually you know, like a book written for a kid with ADHD to do it themselves. Those types of books start in high school to some degree and even then are often overestimating what high school students with poor executive function are capable of. So it's a lot about helping them understand that they're really wonderful kids and doing well in spite of their school difficulties, which is a tough message. You know, it's like, it's not the message they're often feeling. So it's a lot about making them feel confident, valuing their strengths, valuing what they're, you know, good at in essence, like finding them those skills, letting them thrive in different parts of life. And then the adults most often create the structure that they learn from in essence. Okay, let's take one more Susan you have over there and then we'll go out in the hallway. Hi, I have a question with regards to um, if you have any thoughts and research based on the education of how our kids nowadays are being taught, for instance, in math and repetitiveness uh -huh. and how that might benefit them, especially kids with ADHD, um, um, and then moving forward into the high school the, years. That's a great question. So the trend, how do trends in education affect ADHD? I think the short answer, it's a really important one for everyone because it really is a way to advocate is that to me, most of the trends going on in education nowadays are very executive function based. They're asking kids to problem solve and manage projects and do things based on executive function. So in large part, many of the new trends in education are making things harder for kids with ADHD because anything you learn to the point that it's fluent is no longer putting demands on executive function. So when kids with ADHD are taught skills to the point that they're totally learned, you know, it frees up executive function in essence. So even uh, when it comes to like problem-based math learning, you know, if you have your math facts down cold and your formulas down cold, you're going to have an easier time with the math. Or when it comes to writing, you know, like there's some, one study that said that more than half of boys with ADHD could be diagnosed with a writing disorder too. And that's because executive function is the part of your brain you use to organize your thoughts and get them on paper. So a more structured approach to writing, an old school approach to writing is far easier for most kids with ADHD. So most of the trends going on right now really do uh, increase the challenges for kids with ADHD in my experience.